Thanks everybody for coming, uh, mostly thanks to Matt for coming between radio and television programmes uh, today to talk about, obviously Matt doesn't need any introduction to you guys and either I don't, don't think does Michael O'Leary, so we'll just crack on into it. Matt, why did you write this book? Okay, thank you very much first of all to the journal for inviting me along here tonight and Eason as well for facilitating us. Um, Michael O'Leary is one of the most interesting people that I've had the opportunity to interview during my time as a journalist and broadcaster over the last 30 years. Uh, my first time coming across him would have been back 1994. Uh, just as a little bit of background, although some of you may be familiar with the work that I do in radio and television, uh, hopefully you are, um, I started work as a business journalist. Um, I started back in 1988, working in Business and Finance magazine. Uh, then when the Sunday Business Post started in 1989, um, I was there for the launch of the newspapers, one of the first reporters that they hired. And I worked in business journalism up until 1996 before I became editor of the Sunday Tribune. So I would have covered Tony Ryan and GPA and the establishment of Ryanair in my years, early years as a business journalist. I would always have been very interested in it. And in my time afterwards in the Tribune and in my broadcasting career, Michael O'Leary has always been a businessman who sort of transcended the business pages, who because of his willingness to speak uh, so provocatively and frankly about various issues, tends to command airtime on radio and television and inches of newspaper coverage as well. So uh, he's always been a really fascinating, interesting character. So. Uh, a couple of years ago, Michael McLaughlin and Penguin asked me about the possibility of writing a book about Michael O'Leary. And obviously, I was interested immediately in that and did think, well, hold on a second, there have been some good books written. And indeed, uh, Alan Ruddock, the late Alan Ruddock, who would have been a friend of mine, had written a very uh, good book which appeared in 2007. But so much has actually happened to Reiner and to Michael O'Leary since 2007 that I thought, yeah, this is definitely worth getting into. This is worth finding out about the things that have happened in the last decade and referring back to before that. And uh, I started work on the project back in 2016. And uh, I will admit I was, and I don't think I've even told Michael this, so he's here in the audience from Penguin. This might have become as a surprise to him. But at around September last year, I was actually thinking of throwing my hat at it. Uh, particularly because I had just taken on the role doing the television show uh, late at night as well. I probably had half the work done on the book at that stage, uh, but I also was a feeling I just needed something to really get a grip on it, to get it to be the book that I wanted it to be. And then, of course, just as I was about thinking of phoning him and saying, you can have your money back, I'm not actually going to do it now, uh, we had the debacle last year, in September last year, of all the cancellations of flights with 700,000 passengers were impacted. And I realised that here we are, this is a really interesting angle on Michael O'Leary and where he goes from here, and where Ryanair goes from here. Uh, how is he actually going to deal with a crisis which followed such a major shift in the airline's policy, uh, always getting better, low fares made easy, trying to be nice to the customer, and suddenly he had a crisis to contend with. Was the book boring, the initial book then that you had planned at that stage? Was that the problem? Um, it wasn't boring, but it just needed something to give it that little extra twist to make it different to what had come before. And I think we do have the elements in the book, uh, the particularly the change in 2013 when that came out. And that in itself was very interesting, very interesting from a business point of view for somebody like O'Leary who had his principles to which he always adhered to do a sort of a vault fast at that stage. And then to see the crisis that emerged in 2017, when suddenly he got something significantly wrong or got a couple of things in near succession significantly wrong. And he's been battling the consequences of that ever since. And that has made Reiner now an even more interesting company than it had been before. Uh, and that's saying something. But one other, I suppose, comparison that I draw and uh, I think it is relevant. I would regard Ryanair as probably the most significant Irish company to emerge since Guinness over 250 years ago. It's had that much of an impact on not just lives in Ireland and making low air tra low fare air travel available to people, but it has a, had a dramatic impact across the European Union. And it is not an exaggeration to say that the, the integration of the European Union, the freedom of movement for people for work and for holidays at prices they could afford, has largely been driven by the low-cost model that Ryanair enforced in Europe. Yeah, you mentioned in the book that Michael Leary has the pleasure of always being right. So in September 2017, then, when you changed your mind, you said, yes, I am going to do this book. Were you surprised 
that you were calling it that he was wrong? Well, I'm surprised that he sort of lost control because I think that's the one thing that with Michael O'Leary, he is so intent on keeping control of things and we may get to it in a little while. The one thing that he is absolutely obsessed about is maintaining control over costs. Uh, he just hates spending money. He has an allergic reaction to spending money. Um, so he got caught on a couple of things. He got caught, first of all, because of maintaining too tight a balance between the availability of pilots and the flights that actually had to go. Uh, he got caught there and he got into trouble. Then a second problem emerged because his big mouth. He went to an annual general meeting he, of the shareholders, which coincided with this problem emerging. Uh, he made his apologies. He got away with it with the shareholders, but emboldened by that and lacking somebody else who could rein him in and tell him this is not the thing to do, Michael, or just shut up, Michael. He insulted all the pilots who we depended on to fly the aircraft, but said basically described them almost not quite like performing monkeys, but not far off it, saying the aircraft fly themselves. They just need to be sitting in the cockpit for takeoff and landing. And that really enraged the pilots and led to the situation whereby coming up to Christmas with the threat of strikes, he capitulated and he allowed the trade unions to represent the workers in negotiations over paying conditions. Now, we got the usual bull about how they always knew this was going to happen and this is something that they were going to do to get a bigger share of the market in France. The reality is, and it's one of the key trains of uh, Michael O'Leary's career, he hates trade unions, he hates having to deal with them as representatives of his employees because as far as he's concerned, they put up his costs and they reduce his flexibility to do as he want. And uh, it has been a major crisis for Michael O'Leary and everything has changed from him since, which is, I think, was one of the more interesting parts of the book for me. Yeah, it's not the Michael O'Leary we recognise. So let's go back. You were saying he was always someone who fascinated you from the very start of your career. What, what was the first time you met him? What was that like? Uh, I remember a number of occasions. Um, well, one time I remember being at a Ryanair press conference in early 1993 which Ray McSharry um, was the chairman at the time and O'Leary was chief executive and he hardly opened his mouth. He left everything to Ray McSharry almost to deal with. So he was almost quite anonymous. I remember the first time I did a substantial sit down interview with him. I went out to uh, Dublin airport uh, to meet him in the rickety headquarters that they had out there at the time. It was a uh, pretty, uh, not much money was spent on the Ryanair headquarters. It certainly wasn't a place where a corporate titan to be was a sort of luxuriating in a large office with all the creature comforts. Uh, and I remember interviewing him and finding him a really outgoing, personable character, uh, somebody who wasn't afraid to say things that other businessmen perhaps are always too cautious to say. Um, and just a very small thing. And I saw he can actually be a very, very mannerly man. As it happened, I do remember that I was heading off that weekend to go to a rugby international. So I was going from the headquarters up to one of the terminals to get a flight. And he insisted on driving me up there rather than me walking up or anything. And just the small little things. And Did he charge you? No, he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I, but I, another one, and there's loads of stories, and unfortunately, for reasons of space, I couldn't get into the book. And there are also stories that, because I couldn't authoritatively second source them, that I wasn't able to put in the book. But I, I do remember there was one occasion he used to, when I, before I took on the last word in Today FM, um, I used to every second week present the Sunday Business Show on Today FM. Uh, Ted Harding, who was the editor of the Sunday Business Post, would do the other week. And occasionally, this was in the days before Michael O'Leary was married, I'd ring him and persuade him to come in to review the Sunday newspapers. And he was a guy who didn't bother or didn't mind about having to come in on a Sunday morning. It was the time before he was married, before he had children. And he would come in and review the papers. And I remember one day we had him and another guest reviewing the papers. And she had, which happens very, very rarely on radio, she uh, just completely froze. She couldn't say anything. And O'Leary was absolutely brilliant in the way that he covered for her. He was an absolute gentleman. And he realized, like I did, that you know she couldn't. She just literally froze. And he came in and he started taking the questions. And I sort of went to him and carried it on. And we went to an ad break. And she was very, very upset. And uh, he was really genuinely solicitous as to how she was. Look, it's all right. Glad we get through the rest of it and stuff. And I just thought, again, it was a very natural human side from him, a very gentlemanly thing to do, which was at odds with the uh, persona that Ryanair had already adapted at that stage of showing no sympathy or no tolerance to anybody on their flights who did anything that was regarded by Ryanair as being wrong. 
What's your relationship with him like now? I don't have a relationship with him as such. I, I never look to have relationships with the people that I interview on radio or television, that I write about in newspapers. I'm not interested. I'm not looking to be their friends, to hang out with them or anything like that. Um, he, I did contact him in relation to doing an interview for the book. Um, I've done many interviews with him over the years, which I've been able to draw upon from the book. Uh, but I did want to do an interview with him for the specific purpose of the book. Well, I didn't, I didn't. I, was, I didn't expect him to agree based on his previous uh, hostility towards books about him and Reiner. So I didn't expect it. And in some respects, I didn't want it. And the reason I explain why I didn't want it, I didn't want him by giving me the interview to start thinking he could start controlling the output of the book. I wanted it to be as honest as it possibly could be without feeling that I necessarily owed him anything. So it was to my considerable surprise when, when the book was published and uh, shortly after an extract appeared in the Irish Times, an edited extract in late September, uh, that he came out and issued a statement um, condemning the book. No, fine. At that stage, I don't believe he could have read the book because it was in very small circulation. And judging by the statement that he actually put out, he definitely hadn't read the book because he was condemning things in it that actually weren't in it. Um, but he also then, and I was disappointed, if not surprised, that he made a statement saying that I had uh, that he had asked me not to write the book and that he had asked me not to write it because of a uh, consideration for his wife and family. And that is a surprise. I actually brought along with me the letter that she actually had sent to me. So here you are, nice here's your copy. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I have, there's a copy of it. Now I have redacted my address as well on it. But um, basically when I wrote to him in early February, 2017, he sent me back a letter and said, well, I wish you well with your proposed book about Ryanair, a much more interesting subject than one about me. And I should just clarify at that stage, probably the focus was a bit more on Ryanair, but changed later in the year to O'Leary. He said, I'm afraid I have no interest in such books and therefore won't be available for interview on it. I'm sure there is plenty of information available in the public domain and from other interviewees to allow you to tell the Ryanair story without my spin on it. Now, how can you then come out and issue a statement in September this year saying that he had asked me not to write the book, not to invade his privacy for respect for his wife or children? That didn't happen. Quite clearly, he said, there's plenty of information available in the public domain and from other interviewees to allow you to tell the story. And that's what I've actually done. But he's a man who knows how to play the media, which is delved into a lot in the book. So what do you think he was playing at with that statement? Um, I know what he was doing. He was under pressure from one particular individual who... Uh, was very upset at the edited extract, who felt that he hadn't come particularly well out of it. And if he had read the book, he would have seen there was a lot more in him, about him in it, this other individual, uh, which would have uh, cooled his jets a little bit. But he put Michael O'Leary under such pressure, Michael O'Leary issued this statement. That's according to a number of sources that I have internally, but they were able to tell me why it happened at the time it did. So I've not made any effort to contact Michael O'Leary. I mean, I don't really care whether he likes the book or not. Or what I think is, as far as I'm concerned, it's whether the reader likes it as being an honest account of Michael O'Leary's career and of Reiner. Speaking of his love-hate relationship, I guess, with the media, one of the sentences you write, and I won't quote too much from the book, but um, whenever he wanted attention from a gullible media, it was a tried and trusted method that worked every time. Yeah, it's, it's funny when you start going back through everything and you know, I've researched voluminous amounts of newspaper articles, documents, whatever. And I sort of knew this anyway coming to it because having been around so long myself covering these issues, um, whenever he wants a bit of publicity, he tends to trot out the same story as if it's new. And a gullible media often laps it up. Now, it can often be because you might have younger people who are working in a newsroom or on the business desk who don't have an institutional memory of what he has done in the past. Do you include yourself in that? Yeah, yeah. Media? Or sometimes you sort of play along with it because it's a bit of a laugh. So, I mean, how many occasions has he said that he wanted to introduce coin operated slots for the toilets on a flight? He's done it a number of times. He's spoken about um, charging overweight people for seats on a number of occasions over the years. Things that you know most people think is genuinely offensive, and because it can be genuinely offensive, some of the stuff, it gets media coverage. And 
it happens on a regular cycle. I mean, he, he actually is, if you follow him closely, you see the same expressions and same stories coming up on a regular basis for different audiences, depending on which country he's actually moving to. Uh, stories come back that he has plans to do this. And if you think, well, actually, he announced that back in Ireland five years ago. Uh, like he's on a number of occasions said he sees all flights in the future as being free, that you wouldn't pay for your tickets, but you pay for all the various add-ons. And that gets jumped upon by the latest set of media to come across why? it. Why? Why do they do it or why does he do it? Well, I, we know why he does it, I think. Why do, why do journalists do it? Why do editors do it? Possibly because they see so many people fly Ryanair. There's 130 million people a year fly Ryanair, so it's one of the best-known brand names across Europe. And also because there's a mischievousness about O'Leary and what he does, and he does things in a way that other airlines and other companies don't do, and he gets attention for it. And media think, ah, oh, yeah, this is a bit of fun. This will get our readers interesting. He is... <coughs> He's the original clickbait. Are we complicit then in this spreading of fake news, clickbait, kind of not great content for our readers? We can be. Um, and again, this is sometimes the, the sort of the paradoxes of <laughs> O'Leary as an individual that you come across, which makes him so fascinating as to whether at times he's doing something just for effect or whether he actually believes it. I mean, again, another thing on a regular basis, he attacks environmentalists. Um, now this is despite the fact you know, he's, you know, he, despite the fact that Ryanair actually is one of the cleanest airlines in the world. It actually has some of the most up-to-date, best-equipped uh, airplanes for actually combating uh, carbon change. But yet he will attack environmentalists and he will do it in a very provocative way, which gets the newspaper headlines that other corporate bosses would not do. And uh, we sort of play along with it. Does he do that because of cost or because of that he cares about climate change? Oh, I, I don't think he has any real uh, interest in climate change. He just wants his aircraft to be the most efficient possible and the most fuel efficient, the cheapest to him, and then he can offer the lower, lower prices and he can fill his aircraft. He is not putting aircraft out there. He's not buying Boeing aircraft, which are the most fuel efficient for the sake of the environment. He's doing it for the sake of keeping his cost down. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of mentions in the book about he will do anything to make money, he will do anything to make Reiner more successful and to, by making himself more successful. And at one point you said even things that go against the grain. What is the grain with Michael O'Leary? Does he know, do any of us know who he is? Do you know who, who he is? In some respects, Michael O'Leary is a very ordinary, simple person. In some respects, he's an extremely complex individual. Um, as I go through my career for the last 30 years of working as a journalist, interviewing people, finding out about people, uh, very few people are black or white. There's all sorts of gradations in between and they can be very different according to different circumstances. Uh, Michael O'Leary is a guy who, as I explain in the book, I mean, he's never been consumed by the love of the aircraft in, or the aviation industry. He's not obsessed by that. He's obsessed by using it as a means of making money. But as he's gone on over the years, I think as he's become more, he has become part of the Ryanair DNA and Ryanair has become part of his DNA. Um, so he's grown more and more into it, but he still doesn't particularly care about the service he's providing, I think. It's more about what money he can actually make out of it. And is he particularly obsessed with how he treats his customers he's obsessed with how he can treat his customers to make the most money out of them so when he was persuaded that he needed to change his approach towards those customers it wasn't because of some Damascan conversion as to how people should be treated it was a question of how will they be treated so I can make more money for Reiner what were the clues when did he become that person were there, were there clues how early in his life that he would become a millionaire well, I think a lot of it goes back to his father, and his father was an interesting uh, character. He was a man from uh, North Cork who ended up working in, in the Midlands and uh, described to me as a sort of um, almost like a Dean Martin character, sort of skinny with the hat going around as if he was a uh, sort of Rat Pack type in rural Ireland in the 1960s and 1970s. He had a succession of businesses, some of which prospered and had generated a lot of cash at the time, uh, some of which failed. And um, I think from the people I've been speaking to, there certainly there would have been, I think Michael O'Leary would always have been very aware of the precariousness 
of the financial situation in which the family enjoyed, that they moved house a lot, like big house, small house, big house again, at various times in their father's career. And his mother, a very, very strong woman, I think would have been credited with keeping the whole thing together and keeping the show on the road at times. So it seems to have given him a complete understanding of buying and selling. As he said once about his father, his father had his, a, a, had a habit of buying at the top of the market and selling at the bottom. He would be very much sort of contrarian in his position as to when he actually does things. He keeps his costs as low as he possibly can in every aspect of his life. He, he keeps the costs low and he doesn't, but he doesn't spend what he doesn't have to spend. He, he always makes sure that he has cash in the bank. Uh, it is assumed personally as well as corporately. Ryanair keeps enormous amounts of cash in the bank. And yet here's the paradox again, which I found absolutely fascinating talking to people about this, because he worked with Tony Ryan when Tony Ryan nearly went bust. And Tony Ryan nearly went bust because of a punt that he took in relation to placing an enormous order for aircraft at the wrong time in the aviation cycle and he ran out of money and he wasn't able to take delivery of the aircraft got into enormous debts and nearly went bankrupt and only Michael O'Leary was major part in saving him from actually going into personal bankruptcy and yet this man Michael O'Leary who was so conservative in relation to spending money and the nuts and bolts of things is so cautious about bank debt has made some of the most enormous gambles on the purchase of new aircraft these purchases are a multiple of what GPA ever did as at its time the biggest leasing company in the world. Uh, so he's willing to take enormous risks and risks with the money, the capital of the company and make assumptions that he's going to be able to fill the aircraft in the future to get in enough money to cover all the risk. And he has succeeded to date, but it still is a sort of a dichotomy between the cautious, careful uh, penny pincher and somebody who's willing to spend billions upon billions of Ryanair's money on buying aircraft. It, 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 it's hard to actually marry the two of those together. Yeah, you call him an adapter rather than an innovator. Um, and probably in business now, a lot of people would take that almost as an insult. But tell us a bit about Herb Kelleher and his influence on, on Michael O'Leary. Yeah, when I say he's not an innovator, I mean, there are very few things in which there are new ideas in like running of business. I mean, okay, you may get new technologies, which are the result of uh, breakthroughs in scientific discovery. But when it comes to actually ideas for running businesses, most of the things are adapted. There's very few new things actually come along. Michael O'Leary, like many other Europeans, went over to see Southwest Airlines in the United States of America in the early 90s, uh, run by a Texas lawyer called Herb Kelleher, a man who, as you can tell by the name Kelleher, had his roots back in Ireland. And um, he was generous to anyone who went over who saw the way to show, be shown the way that the business was actually operated on what they call a point-to-point -point basis, not going to primary airports like your uh, Heathrow's or your JFK's, the ones that we would all be familiar with, uh, but going to smaller, out-of-the-way locations, getting the aircraft in and out quickly, very quick turnaround, so that, for example, if an aircraft that might fly by what they call a legacy carrier six times a day would fly eight or ten times a day because they literally got it up and running again 20 minutes after landing, the flights would go off again. So O'Leary went to Southwest. He saw how they did it. The usual stories about going drinking with Kelleher, couldn't remember what he saw, blah, 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 anything to create the myths. And he is a big myth builder as well. And he came back and he ruthlessly put in the low cost approach of Southwest, the pricing structure, the, air, the airport uh, structure as well, going to, but didn't bring in the friendliness and the smile and didn't bring in the trade union uh, negotiations that Southwest have, uh, the representation. And... Uh, just did it better. He did it better than anyone else because he was just utterly ruthless in how he did it. What do you think his genius is then? His genius in some respects is an, an absolute dedication to cost cutting and keeping costs as low as possible, a ruthlessness in relation to that, which is not always shared by everyone in business, no matter how much they say it. He is unsentimental. He's clear-sighted. Uh, he's not visionary, but... He has an enormous degree of sort of cop on. Another example would be that if you all remember back to 9-11 and the immediate aftermath of 9-11, everybody was talking about, oh, people will be too scared to fly. They won't be flying again for years. 
his immediate thing was, no, no, people would fly. They want to go. They'll realize these were one-off events. He offered a seat cell. He loves a seat cell. And he'd fill his planes up. And he also then, as all other airlines started struggling dramatically, he just kept the cost down. People took the gamble on flying with Ryanair. Other airlines went bust. He started buying aircraft cheaply. He did his first enormous deal with Boeing to get new aircraft rather than using second-hand aircraft. He just had enough confidence and self-belief in his understanding of human behavior to actually push forward and think, yeah, people will fly as long as it's cheap enough. And I suppose that's one of the other things as well that I try to really show in the book. You know, he doesn't follow the marketing criteria, the sort of straightforward business criteria that other people have, all the bells and whistles. He's quite basic and he believes, I think, human behavior is quite basic. And uh, he doesn't worry about this whole thing about whether... um, uh, flights are considered you know unfriendly or whether people have to queue he says it's a basic taxi service people know what they're getting a cheap price and they'll be happy and he's been proven to be right but tony ryan really didn't like that yeah this was one of the things i found most fascinating and and again it's strange how these things happen tony ryan is one of the most fascinating people of irish 20th century life he was an extraordinary character because he came from. He he set up in business at around the age of forty, having worked as an, a senior Aer Lingus executive, having come from a really quite poor background in, in Tipperary, uh, in Thurles. He came forward, set up GPA, and very quickly became very very wealthy, and developed an extraordinary business, which has gone on to create the basis of the aviation leasing industry that is in Ireland at present, which is one of the great sort of stories of modern day Ireland, uh, how this business has become a global uh, business out of Ireland. But Tony Ryan became something of a snob, maybe because of the background that he came from and was very concerned with airs and graces. He would have worn the finest Savile Row suits, uh, became a patron of the arts and uh, adopted a rather plummy accent. Now, he was a very engaging character on his day. And on many occasions that I met him, he could be brilliant. And other days, he could be an absolute grump and a grouch and growling at you and whatever. But he was a fascinating character. He was utterly embarrassed by O'Leary's approach to customer care. And the book details an awful lot of correspondence between the two of them, uh, how unhappy he was about the way uh, that customers were actually treated. He felt it was unnecessary. O'Leary, who actually came from, in the sense of, as although I've already outlined about the uncertainty about the family finances, it never got so bad that he was taken out of Clongos College where he went to school at a time, you know, when Clongos was, again, the most expensive boarding school in the country. And um, despite the fact that O'Leary at times plays up the sort of man of the common people thing, you know, he wasn't necessarily. And this guy who came from the Clongos Jesuit educated background didn't care about customer service. They got into all these rows. And then suddenly, in 2013, O'Reilly, or sorry, O'Leary decides for business interests that it was more important to actually start serving this market. So he just suddenly started doing all the things that Tony Ryan had been pleading with him a decade earlier and two decades earlier to do. How did that relationship foster and how did it stay strong in business and in in friendship, even throughout all of those those fights, it's one of those fascinating relationships. Uh, Tony had uh, th- Tony, who's dead now, about a decade, had uh, three sons, one of whom is dead. Uh, Carl. There was also Shane and Declan, and Declan Ryan would have been very very close to Michael and would have been very important in working alongside him in the early years, as is detailed in the book as well. Um, but to some extent, Mick, as the family knew him, uh, became almost like a fourth son to Tony Ryan. And in some respects, got treated better than his three sons in the way that it can sometimes be that um, Mike, Michael O'Leary was well able to row with Tony Ryan. They did row, but yet he still understood who was the boss, or at least until such time as he became boss of Ryanair and chief executive. And suddenly he decided that even though it was Tony Ryan's name on the aircraft, it was going to be run the way that he wanted to run it. And that led to certain tensions. But from what has been said to me by family members, whatever, I mean, there was a, still a genuine love there between them. And uh, which was, I suppose, really sort of shown as well in the in the funeral oration given by Michael O'Leary. I mean, it was a genuine um, understanding of Tony Ryan and his brilliance and a respect and a love for what he had done and for the opportunities that he had provided for Michael O'Leary. 
Yeah, because one of the other things that Tony Ryan, you detail in the book, really didn't like the rude and crass advertising, the different things that Michael O'Leary would do for media coverage, you know, for people to say, oh, he speaks it, he says it as it is, the calendar, all of those things we associate with Ryanair and Michael O'Leary, but things we have not seen recently. No, and I think part of that has probably come down to the fact that he is a married man with children who are getting older. So you don't, when you're in a situation like that, I mean, this sort of laddish, loaded magazine style approach that he had at one stage when he started saying that he would put pornography on the into the uh, aircraft that you could watch on the back of the seats. And he said, I'd be one of its best customers. You know, those are the type of things that perhaps you might say when there's a certain degree of immaturity in your life. But when you actually get that little bit older and a bit more experienced, when you're married with children and stuff, you probably don't want to be saying that type of stuff again or even perhaps be reminded of having said it. Yeah, because is any of that actually him? Is it, was he a lad back then? An awful lot of it I was just done for effect. An awful lot of it was just done to get the newspaper headlines. I mean, one of the, I mean, on a more prosaic level, but I still thought it was interesting. One of his former commercial directors told me the story of how, uh, he, although he hates certain parts of the media, you know, even though he, he talks to lots of people in the media, he actually has a contempt for most journalists, and clearly now me included. Um, he has that contempt and disrespect for them. And there are particular publications that he hates. And he hates The Guardian and The Observer, for example. But he always took a front page ad for a period of years on The Observer. Every week, Reiner would take a quarter page ad on the front of The Observer. And the reason behind that was, as explained to me, was that at that stage, Reiner wouldn't spend money on television advertising. They regarded it as been a waste of money, which they now do television advertising since 2013. But that has been a major change. And the budgets were limited. And they would do all their own copy as well for their advertising rather than using agencies. But they decided that they would buy the quarter page and the front page of the Observer because O'Leary had noticed as he was watching television every Sunday morning at home, the British politics programmes, the reviews of the papers, they always put the front pages up on screen. So if he had a Ryanair ad, quarter page and front page, while they were focusing and talking about the story on the front page of the paper, he had a big Ryanair ad. And he, as far as he was concerned, he was hitting his television audience in that case. And sorry, it just reminds me as well, he, his favourite newspaper by distance is the Daily Telegraph, which might tell you something about his politics as well. Even if he was a very much anti-Brexit, he was very anti-Brexit for financial reasons for Ryanair. Uh, but if he talks about, you know, not wanting family details uh, be published in my book. Well, details of his honeymoon were published in the Daily Telegraph because he gave an interview to the travel section. So he's quite happy to give details and interview in information about his private life when it suits him, if he feels, again, it's a way that he can promote the Reiner brand. Yeah, we're actually in the journal, one of, um, we've gone through a period of being blacklisted um, by Reiner. So what he what they do is they don't invite you to press conferences or um, email you out statements. And, and then that might happen for a period of months and then you'll be put back on. So it's like being in a, a relationship, you're quite never quite sure where, where you land in it. Is that um, an abusive relationship? Yeah. <laughs> and but then if you call them a no frills airline within 30 seconds you'll get an email from them saying they are absolutely not a no frills airline but you pointed out Matt that's been something that has really irked O'Leary and Reiner for a number of years now the no frills yeah because recently I saw somebody saying that he, he was giving out about that again in recent months but that goes back again about five or six years it even goes back a year before they brought in the Always Getting Better uh, program back in 2012 or 2013. I'm trying to remember exactly which. Uh, Robin Kiley started this thing as the director of communications, contacting broadcasters and newspapers, giving out, we are low fares, it's not no frills. But low fares, I suppose, is a marketing slogan, and uh, it's not up to us to be promoting their marketing slogans. Although they went through a number of years where any time you would have had any representative of Ryanair, on the programme, be it Michael O'Leary, Michael Cawley, Kenny Jacobs, any of them. Um, you know, they, they use every broadcast opportunity as they think to start plugging their own slogan, slogans. So they would start telling you low fares, Ryanair is the best value. And they would, sorry, stop. You're not doing an interview for advertising purposes. We're asking you questions here on behalf of the listeners. But uh, they just saw everything as an opportunity to promote and plug. And I also know one of these things as well is that 
Uh, one of the frustrations at times when you write a book is after you've written the book, some of the people that you haven't spoken to, the few people start coming along and telling you stories. And I had that experience recently with, um, uh, with somebody who was in charge of advertising in one of the newspapers back in the 1990s. And he said that um, every week he would get called out to uh, Michael Cawley, the financial director's office, and Cawley would go through the advertising rates that there was been charged for the paper that weekend uh, and say, we only had so many phone calls after that ad appeared. So they were trying to, they were trying unscientifically to do a correlation between the number of phone calls making bookings on a Monday after the advertising had appeared in the Saturday and, and Sunday editions of the particular newspaper. Yeah, I found that really interesting through the book with every deal that Michael O'Leary made, if you flipped it, he would be so annoyed at being ripped off by the person on the other end of it. And that's, yeah, that, that is really something that really struck me that, you know, that he haggles until recent years when the business was smaller. Every Friday, a stack of bills would be brought in for him to sign off on. The Reiner wouldn't pay the bills until he had actually personally signed off on them. And these could be for quite small sums of money as well. And he would sort of indiscriminately almost at times just mark down, oh, he's overcharging, he's overcharging, knock down the price. Can you imagine what his reaction would be if somebody did that to Reiner in relation to the money that was owed to Reiner? So let's get to, we've talked a lot about the decisions he was right about. Um, one of the ones he was wrong about, and just quickly, is that he thought the internet wouldn't catch on, which is probably my favourite uh, Michael O'Leary anecdote. Um, and then as soon as they actually did get on the internet, as his colleague said, he started behaving like he'd invented it. <laughs> Um, but he has got things wrong over the last couple of years. Um, the tagline of the book is turbulent times. What is his biggest mistake over the last two years? Well, it, it's a question of whether you regard as recognising the trade unions, the right to negotiate as a mistake. A lot of people would regard that as a right, which is long overdue that the company should have been doing it for a while. But I would suspect he would regard that as the consequence of a series of mistakes that he may have made. Now, look, you can't run a business for 25 years. And it's extraordinary to think that he actually will be next January, 25 years chief executive of this airline, having worked with it as the effective boss in many respects behind the scenes in the previous six years. That's an extraordinary long time for anybody to run a business, but particularly one of the size of Ryanair and his continuing growth. I think he... He's in an exceptionally difficult situation. You, you have to make mistakes along the way. You make loads of mistakes. Um, but he certainly made a mistake taking his eye off the ball in 2017 when they ran out of pilots. That was an enormous mistake. And I think his problem here was that he blames himself for delegating there rather than being totally on top of it. When the business has got to the size it has gotten to, he has to delegate. He can't be on top of everything. But I think he has this fear if he does delegate, is everything going to be done to the way it should be done? So we're now, as the business continues to expand, it has ambitions to get to 200 million passengers per annum. Um, it's profitability, 1.45 billion to the end of March, coming back down to about 1.1 billion this year. Still an enormous sum of money, obviously. But given what investors expect of Ryanair, and he is a much bigger business. He now is running into the most, he's in the middle of the most difficult period he's had running the company since back 30 years ago when he was running it to save it from closure. What would you predict for the future of Michael O'Leary and Reiner? For a guy who's not massively into aviation, he has come, Reiner has become part of his life. I find it very hard to believe that he could walk away from it and do something else because anything else he goes to, he wouldn't have the level of control that he has over Reiner. Um, there will be all sorts of speculation. He took grave offence at what I wrote very carefully in the book about how others were speculating during the summer, the meetings he was having with Willie Walsh, uh, the boss of IAG, which owns uh, British Airways in Iberia, whether he was actually trying to get Willie Walsh to come back. And in some respects, you see, Willie Walsh would be the best available candidate to take over from Michael O'Leary if he was to leave Ryanair tomorrow or even next year or two years' time. Okay, there's not much difference in age between the two of them, but Willie Walsh has the experience of dealing with a highly trade unionised organisation. He has the experience of dealing with a major airline, all the things that have to be done, with the shareholders of a major PLC, and may have something to prove as well back in Ireland. And I think that is important to O'Leary as well. O'Leary 
has remained living in Ireland to his great credit, unlike other billionaires, has not gone into tax exile, has not tried to uh, minimise his tax affairs. I mean, obviously, he would have minimised his tax payments as much as possible through legal avoidance measures in Ireland, but he hasn't gone offshore to take further advantage as would be available to him. Um, I think he's a patriotic in the sense that he wants to see an Irish person take over from him. But I'm not sure that even if he found Willie Walsh or somebody else who would be willing to take over from him, I'm not sure at this stage whether he would actually be happy in letting the reins go. And uh, Peter Bellew... Who, Is that a dangerous place for a company? It's not the best place in the world, but I mean, uh, Peter Bellew, who... Um, some people have speculated about since he was brought back in a year ago during the crisis, and he is not going to be the next boss of Ryanair, according to anyone I've spoken to. Uh, when I interviewed Bellew about this on radio, and he said uh, O'Leary will be 100 before he's carried out of here. And to a certain degree, there might be a certain degree of truth in that. I just find it very hard for him to see how he's going to let it go. He could be there for many, many years yet. Do you think anything in the last two years, any of the, the Ryanair fights about the bags, the strikes, um, how he has treated pilots, how he talks about trade unions, has any of that impacted on his, um, the opinion of Irish people on him? Because, you know, we have that thing about, you know, Michael O'Leary for, for Taoiseach, Michael O'Leary should run the country, read any journal article, that'll be the comment section underneath. Do you think that perception of him is still there or has it been dinted by the last two years? Funny enough, I was thinking about this recently, that um, when the Peter Casey vote came for president, an awful lot of, leaving aside, I've never heard Michael O'Leary say one word, good, bad or indifferent about travellers, so let's please leave that aside. But some of the other things that Michael O'Leary has said over the years would very much have tapped into almost that Peter Casey type audience. And particularly in 2016, after the general election, he was, you know, there were some people around who wondering, God, is he actually interested in going into politics? Because he has so many things to say about how public services are run and financed. And he had comments to make about social welfare payments. And he wanted to sack anyone in public transport who went on strike. Um, lots and lots of stuff which would sort of be there on that particular political spectrum. Uh, so... But I don't think he could actually run anything. I mean, again, there would be a sort of a Trump-like dimension in this, in that you need a different set of skills to run and govern public organisations and government. And I think he's aware of that himself. He is clever enough and clued in enough to realise that he wouldn't actually have the type of personality and character that would be required to do that. Uh, but he is fascinated by politics. And uh, one of the more interesting things that I discovered, and I ended up reading loads of biographies of the Duke of Wellington on the basis that apparently he has read everything about the Duke of Wellington. And I suppose he loves the sort of thing there, the horses, which he's mad into, and the politics, which he is fascinated by. And sort of, and Wellington was a wealthy man as well. So you can see why he might have been his hero back there. But I don't think you're ever going to see, because of the structure of our Irish politics, uh, Michael O'Leary ever involved in politics. Um, I'll just have one last question and then I'll throw it to the floor if anyone has um, any questions for Matt. Um, just wanted to ask you, Matt, who is next on your hit list? What's the next book in between television programmes and radio shows? And I'm actually not going to answer that. That means he has one already lined up and something is signed <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> no, unfortunately, it hasn't been signed. I, I, I would put it this way. There are, there are two particular individuals that I would be very, very interested in writing about at some stage in the future, but beyond that, I'm not going to say. Male, female? <laughs> not going to say. Business, non-business? <laughs> Any questions from the audience? Sorry, sorry. Did you send him a copy of the book? Did I send him a copy of the book? God, no, he can buy his own copy of the book. <laughs> Nobody ever got a free flight off him, so he's not getting a free book <laughs> off me. Does Michael Leary do the things he does for Michael Leary or Ryanair? For Reiner, but I suppose they're the same thing. I mean, he's become, he has become, I mean, like he's sort of, you know, they talk about half man, half beast. He's half man, half airplane at this stage. Um, you know, it is his life. Um, he is very much, and it is interesting when you see, and I would know lots of other uh, chief executives who take on other directorships and whatever. And uh, again, as I said, some of the things you find out afterwards, uh, somebody did tell me only a couple of weeks ago about one very interesting chairmanship. He was offered another PLC at one stage, apparently, and uh, he thought about it for a day or two and turned it down. 
and that apparently was the closest he ever did actually becoming involved in another major Irish company. Uh, but no, he's one is he he's completely dedicated. No, he has his own personal financial interests. He has an extensive property portfolio. He has this interest in horse racing, as I outline in the book as well. And some of the stories there are very very interesting, and he's been very very successful. Uh, but you know what he what he does he does for Ryanair. Um, yeah, everything that he does and how he's put himself out there. Uh, and that surprises some of the people that he went to secondary school with who I've spoken to. Uh, they say he was sort of a shy individual and people who worked in GPA at the time when he was PA to Ryan at GPA were really surprised at the way, he did, because they said in his early years, in conversations, he could be very shy. His, he could be looking at your shoes and he wasn't this ebullient, self-confident person that you see now in performances. And performances is probably the word. On behalf of Reiner, when the cameras or the microphones are in front of him, he performs. If you were advising a, a startup or another company, would you, would you advise them to try and lure him onto a board uh, as a non-executive director or get him involved in any way at all? <laughs> no. I don't think so. I mean, I think you can learn from some of the things. You can learn from the attention to costs and detail and stuff like that. But I think by his very nature, he would um, he would tend to try and dominate. It's interesting. A number of people have gone to him for things like that or for charity. And he he doesn't really react that well to being asked to do stuff like that or get involved with others. He tends to be fairly single-minded and focused on what he does. Um, you describe Michael O'Leary's sort of Trumpian rhetoric and deliberately being offensive. That's his trademark style. But do you think Irish people sort of give him a carte blanche um, as he is seen as sort of a messianic figure in, in Irish business and he can get away with it because he's Michael O'Leary? To an extent, but he divides opinion for all the people who think he's great and fantastic and give him due respects and regard for what he has done in Reiner, you get lots of people who are actually find him violent, obnoxious and unnecessarily confrontational and aggressive and who won't fly. And I don't think that matters that much to him as long as he gets enough people flying. I mean, it's like the old things that you're told when you're studying marketing or whatever in, in, in college. You know, it's not a question of getting everyone sort of liking you. If only two or three out of 10 potential buyers think you're great and go and buy you, that's enough for you to make money. It doesn't care. It doesn't matter what the other seven think. So he doesn't care if people are offended or dislike what he says, as long as it gets enough attention for sufficient people. He also has, in most cases, as he really does believe there's no such thing as bad publicity because uh, he would track on many occasions bookings after some things that most companies would be, oh my God, we're going to be destroyed by this head and hand stuff. And he embraces it instead and has seen sales track up as a result of some pretty bad controversies he's been involved in. And um, just based on your said about publicity, what about the six cabin crew that were sacked? Is that another ta tactic of his? It's worth the cost. I think he regarded that as great publicity. Yeah, so. I mean, that, that was just, I mean, they, I mean yeah, most companies would have tried in the situation where they're trying to modify trade unions at the moment, you know, would have tried to smooth that over or hide it. He instead took the confrontational approach and, you know, showed them up as he would have seen it for what they did, sacked them. And even if, again, lots of people said, this is a disgrace how you treat your staff and the rest of it. He loves it, thinking there's lots of people who will actually agree with him, enough people, so that he will continue to get business from them. I actually did have one other question. Was there any copyright issues with the cover of the book? I have no idea. Michael, back at the end. Why would there have been copyright issues anyway, Michael? I can't see why there would have been. It's just a coincidence. Those colours are not owned by Ryanair, are they? <laughs> Uh, one of the great things that made Ryanair the airline that it is is their flexibility to their flexibility and in that was that they didn't have to answer to trade unions. Do you think now that they have to answer to trade unions it'll reduce the amount of power Mike Leary has to change the business and react to situations? I think that's actually one of the key, you've put your finger on one of the most important things that's happening to Ryanair at present. The new cost base, the increased costs of having to do the pay deals with the cabin crew and the pilots and all the rest of it, they're talking about adding 100, 120 million a year to costs. And clearly that is something he doesn't want. But I think what's actually really interesting, up until now, the flexibility that he's, he's had, the power that he has had over employees and contractors means that if he wants to set up a new route, they can do it in double quick time. If that route doesn't work out, as often has happened, they just close it. When you have a very trade unionized environment, you have to enter into negotiations about 
the staffing on this particular route, where people go to a base, all the rest of it. It slows down the opening of new routes and makes it more difficult to actually close them if they're not actually delivering profits. I mean, he has been ruthless in closing down bases at, at various uh, airports because they just don't make enough money. When you have a highly unionised workforce, that flexibility is reduced quite dramatically. Right. Thanks very much, everybody, for coming. And thanks to Matt. Matt will have his Sharpie ready if anyone wants to get a book signed. And the books are obviously available at the stand to buy. Thanks very much. Thank you.